Welcome to A Learner's Journey. My name is Molly Sanders, and the goal of this podcast is to inspire and motivate you by connecting you with a variety of passionate horsewomen and men who have dedicated their lives to helping horses and their people. I'm grateful you're here. In this latest podcast episode, I'm going to share with you a conversation I had with Pirelli instructor Nita Jo Rush. I met Nita Jo several years ago, back in a transitional time in my instructor career, where I was moving from teaching one student at a time or small groups to uh, moving into multiple day clinics. And I was still feeling oh, just kind of new to it and nervous about it. And and Nita Jo was gracious enough to invite me to teach with her. We did a three-day event together and I got to know her better. And she's just such a wonderful human being and has some great stories. And she and I were talking on the phone a while back and she was sharing with me where she is. We were kind of catching up. And I some of the things that she was sharing, I just thought, wow, this would be great for people to hear. So I invited her to join me on the podcast and she said yes and now you're going to get to hear that conversation. Hi Nita Joe. Hi Molly how are you? I'm doing good I'm really excited that you uh, agreed to do this with me even though it's a little bit out of your comfort zone to be <laughs> zooming and this kind of thing so um, I'm really excited that you joined. Well, thank you. And it's, it's, I'm looking forward to it, Molly. And, and I'm honored that you invited me to do this. Very, very cool. Um, so one of the questions I have been starting with, and I just, I find it really interesting is um, talking to people about how they got started oh with boy. horses. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to ask you, like, how did it, how did it start? Were you this... born into it? Yeah. Um, yes and no. This is, I can make this a short story, a really long story. It's actually one of my favorite stories to tell. Cool. So when I was three, three and a few months, we in Boulder, Colorado, where I grew up, we moved from town up by the university out into what was then in the countryside. And we had a five acre weed patch, basically. And I don't know how this came to be. I need to ask one of my brothers, but we boarded a couple horses, um, a sorrel or chestnut mare named Cherry, and a black gelding named Blackie. <laughs> and they weren't ours, but my two older brothers rode them. And one of those brothers especially rode Cherry and he actually really liked horses. So when I was four, I think that's when I became enamored because I have somewhere a little pencil drawing of a horse's head that I made when I was three or four. Oh, that's um, great. Because there's a date on it. And I actually remember where I was with my mother when I drew it. So mm. I was quite young. So when I was four, I somehow talked my mother and my brother John was there into letting me ride Cherry. And we didn't have saddles, we were too poor and I don't even know if we had a bridle. So they put me on her bareback alone, which mm -hmm. was like, really? When I look back <laughs> and Cherry started to walk across. We lived on a hill on a gravel, steep gravel road and uh, the horse in the crowd, Blackie nickered at her and she turned around to look and my mom had gotten scared and was running up behind her and of course off cherry went oh no <laughs> and i fell off and split my chin open and cracked my jaw oh uh, my gosh. so that was my introduction um two years later uh, we had neighbors down the hill and they had girls um, about my age and they had horses and those kids could ride i mean everybody rode bareback nobody um and so I was on one of their older horses, trying to get him to go and kicking my little legs. I was barefoot. It was a warm day. And they went cantering by and this horse I was on took off and I fell off and broke my arm. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, um, and you stuck with it. I did. And um, we were a couple years later, my brother bought a horse and when we would borrow a saddle and I don't know whose it was I would ride double with him so I was like in second grade and then he that horse bucked and he got tired of it so he sold her and that was kind of the end of it for him mm -hmm. um, but my mother would take me to a stable in those days you could pay two or three dollars and go out by yourself and so here's this nine-year-old kid I rode a 
a mare named Puck. I th no, what was her name? Anyway, she had really long mule ears and I would ride her alone out through the river and da 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 da. Wow. And when she, and I remember being on the edge of being too scared. I was like, because eh, coming back, she was quite animated and I was just on the verge. But that's when I learned to not fall off and kill myself. Right. Uh, and then by the time I was in fourth or fifth grade, I started having my own horse and, um, and there we went and we rode bareback and my best friend and I raced cars and stole lumber and bricks from houses that were being built and made jumps. And <laughs> we were in a girl saddle club and put on a couple shows. And that's so it so cool. started there. Um, that's really cool. It's amazing to think back on what, what we were allowed to do, even like a business, a business renting you a horse and being like, yeah, go ahead, take it wherever you want. Exactly. And, was, and how different it is now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel really fortunate um, that my best friend who lived, I don't know, a quarter of a mile away and she had a horse and I had a horse. We spent every waking spare moment on those horses together. Yeah. Um, and, you know, from morning till dinner time and then until dusk. I mean, and nobody cared. <laughs> so yeah. it was, we were really fortunate. Yeah, um, that's that's so wonderful. I remember when I was a kid because I... I didn't grow up around horses. Um, I, I grew up and they were nearby. And so any opportunity I had, I'd go and, you know, do a ride or be around people that had them. And, and then, um, but I'd re read all these books. And I remember one of them in particular was, I think it was called Summer Riders, not a very creative title. Yeah. <laughs> and it was about these two friends that live near the beach and every day they'd go and ride on the beach. And that was just wow. my ultimate dream. So like what you're describing, you know, as a young girl, yeah. I would have absolutely loved to have been able to go out whenever I wanted and been out all day long. So it's so great. Um, it was great. And you know, my, my family, we didn't live on a ranch. My dad was a scientist and you know, we, but I was, the, and I was the one who stuck with it. So I, one of the nice things was I didn't have anybody telling me what to do with my horse and how to mm -hmm. do it, mm -hmm. um, you know, so right. I just got to do whatever I want. And I, I got hurt a couple of times, but nothing bad, nothing right. bad after, after those two early, early falls. <laughs> right. <laughs> the first one being caused by your mom. Right. <laughs> she must have felt terrible. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Different world then. So where along the line did you start having um, ideas that you wanted to do it professionally? How oh my gosh, Molly. I stumbled into that. Um, when I, I remember being a freshman in high school and we took a career interest inventory test kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember the answers came up for me and it was a really sexist test. I mean, you could tell the questions you were supposed to answer if you were a boy. Mm -hmm. And it said I would be either an author, a writer mm -hmm. or work on a ranch. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, so I really never dreamed that I would ever have a career with horses. Um, so it was when I got into Pirelli and I was taking more and more time away from my practice, private practice in psychology, and I was still having to pay rent and pay staff and I was gone more and more. And it occurred to me, oh, when I learned there was an instructor program, I didn't know there was at first. I thought, oh, maybe I could teach part-time and make a little money instead of spending all this money. My son was in ninth grade, he was gonna go to college and. Um, so I just kind of stumbled into it. And I remember racing a little bit to get my level two, the old, old level two with galloping right. and lead changes. You had to get level two with excellence to get into the instructor program. Mm -hmm. So I remember finishing that up on video for Lee Smith. Um, and I got in and it was just kind of, I really stumbled onto it. I didn't say, oh, this is what I want to do. I just thought, oh, okay, let's do this. And then right. this, this and then could pay it, for my hobby. Yeah. And it just right. captured me and it just, it took me over. Um, I didn't take it over. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I can imagine that with your background, so you, you were a practicing psychologist for how yeah. long? 
Um, in one form or another for about 24 years. Wow. Oh yeah. my gosh. Okay. I did not realize yeah. that. So you'd had this whole other career. I had a career. Yeah. I was, and I started out as a social worker and then got licensed as a psychologist, long story. And, um, working at a, the local college, working at a medical clinic, then in private practice, um, so yeah, uh, my best friends were my coworkers in this group private practice that we owned together. And um, wow, I so loved- was that part of? Do you think that's what was part of what drew you to Pirelli? Was your your already you already had an interest in psychology, and then here's this program that is looking at the psychology of horses and people. Yes, in a way. Um, Yes, in the sense that the focus on the relationship mm-hmm. really appealed to me. Right. Um, be, I, you mentioned the books you read as a kid, and I grew up, this will date me, watching Fury on television and reading all the Black Stallion books mm-hmm. and my friend Flicka. And um, I wanted that magical relationship with a horse. And I think just for a number of reasons, um, I was attuned to relationships anyway. I mean, that was part of being a therapist. Um, right. And so that, that really appealed to me. Um, yeah. And yeah. I, I wanted that magic. Um, and I got it, basically. Right. Um, right found it, learned it, whatever. Yeah. That's interesting too. Um, cause you know, I've done a few of these interviews now and, uh, Fury came up, David Lichman mentioned that that was one of his favorites. And then, um, Kathy Barr mentioned, uh, Black Stallion, that that's what, you know, she wanted. And then she started to see that that's when she went to campus and started to see what Pat and Linda were doing. She's like, they're living like the black stallion so um and there were no there weren't i remember my daughter reading the thoroughbred series and so in my era and maybe yours i don't know there were no none of these stories had girls in them they were all about boys except for misty of shinkotig and then the girl didn't get to go on the ride i remember being so pissed off that right she right. couldn't go. so it was it was interesting that they still captivated us little girls yes. um, yeah that is interesting i had not ever thought of that yeah there weren't um, there were no girls but the heroes were the horses not right us. yeah 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 huh that's really interesting <laughs> um so one of the things that i am fascinated with is the learning process. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also really interesting that when people get into a challenging time in their journey, in their learning, um, we tend to, as humans, we tend to feel like we're the only ones that are having that much trouble. Right. Right. And so one of the things um, I mentioned to you when we were chatting just a little bit ago, that one of the things that's been so helpful for me is talking to people like you and, you know, other mentors of mine along the way and hearing that they've had similar things happen and that, yeah, they felt like an idiot too. And, you know, it really, it's a really empowering thing. So I am going to ask you a little bit about that. Like when you look back over your journey, um, what, what were, what was challenging for you um, as a learner? Oh, wow. There's, it's a great question, Molly. And as I was saying, when we um, first started talking of all the questions that you listed as possible, that's the one I went, huh? <laughs> Cause so many things aligned just right for me. Right. And it, that alignment might not have been right for somebody else but it was right for me. So it was sort of like, well, what got in my way? What made it difficult? And I, I think, you know, the, the saying, you want to be particular without being critical of your horse. Well, I think that's true of us too. Right. And I know that part of my being able to be successful was being particular, but then I would, with myself, like, I'm not going to cut corners, da, 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 da. but then to be self-critical. Right. And I can remember the first time I was at the ISC in Pagosa Springs, um, and one of the other, we were student instructors, we were new. Um, and just feeling this gal, and we later became friends, but she said something to me. I asked her something or I was struggling with something. And she just gave me this answer like, well, it's just Sally. 
you know, sort of like, well, and I just, I was embarrassed and I was pissed. <laughs> uh, so there were times like that when I just felt like, oh my God, you know, this is, I felt like I'm in junior high school again. And, uh, you know, the cool kids get to be over here and they get to have the savvy and then the rest right. of us are over here. Right. And I ran into that sometimes with some of the uh, folks who lived on campus and studied with Pat for months at a time. Mm -hmm. A bit of a, you know, you you guys don't really know anything. Um, right. So I let that get in my way some, but not a lot, but some. Mm -hmm. I think just, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, being expecting a lot and being in a hurry, which made it hard sometimes to slow down uh, in right. order to later go faster. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally, I can totally uh, relate to that story. And I think. It's interesting when you're with a group of people, whether it's, you know, in school, like you said, it brought back memories of, you know, junior high or high school, when you're with a group of people and we're all learning together, it's such a vulnerable thing to do. Yes. And sometimes we can be jerks when we're vulnerable, yeah. <laughs> right? And we yeah. want to, we want to look like, oh, no, I got it figured out. Right. I got this. So when somebody asks you something, it may have been the, at the, the wrong moment for this person, like she was not in a very right. strong place herself. And so she says something like, oh, well, let's just take savvy. You obviously don't have it, right? <laughs> exactly. You know, and I've had things like that said to me. And, you know, in hindsight, I think um, that those folks were most likely in a really similar place. Yeah. But and for it, whatever it, reason. Uh, yeah, I think we, a psychologist friend of mine, when we were working together years and years ago said, you know, most of us, all of us maybe walk around looking like we have it together better than we think we do. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so interesting. So we, we uh, got a chance to work together a few years ago. Um, right. Which was wonderful. It was, it was really fun. I was just starting out uh, as an instructor. I just moved to Washington state and you were coming to the area cause you have family here. Mm -hmm. And I remember reaching out to you and we got to talking and it was a really fun conversation. And we decided, well, let's try teaching a something together. Yeah. We taught a what three day clinic. Together. Yeah. Yeah. Which was so, I mean, it was, it was really, it was at the beginning of my, you know, teaching more than one day and here you'd been doing it for quite a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it was such a wonderful opportunity for me to teach with someone that had so much experience. Like you were like, it, you know, it was no big deal, you know, and you had all this stuff that was just a part of you. And I had to like write notes and <laughs> prepare the night before. And, and I was so nervous to, you know, to be teaching at all, but then, you know, to be teaching in front of you and you were so supportive and sure. gracious. <laughs> well, it was, it was such a great, it was a wonderful experience for me. And one of the things that really stood out beyond, besides your confidence and your uh, humility, like, this is an aside, but I have noticed that the further along people get and the more experience they get and the more times they've fallen on their face, which is part of getting experience, right? Mm -hmm. The more humility people tend to have, yeah. right? And I yeah. found that with you and I found that with a lot of the instructors that I worked with that had been doing it for a while. Yeah. So that was one of the things I loved. And then just the, the confidence, you were such a wonderful leader for the, for the group. And one of the things that you said that I've borrowed and I always credit you, but um, I just love, you said to the folks, um, cause some of the people that were in the clinic were not super confident riders. Yeah. And, um, and so you said that it takes three yeses to ride in a clinic with me. You're, you need a yes from your horse, a yes from you and a yes from me. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that is brilliant. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> why, why, wh like, how do you remember how you came up with it? Or like, why was that a good thing to share? Well, I borrowed it from somebody. Cool. And I think it was Linda and she may have borrowed it from Stephanie Burns. I don't know for sure. I don't know the complete uh, custodial chain of that, but right. I'm pretty sure that I borrowed that also. Um, Very cool. And um, I really liked it partly. 
Well, number one, safety. Um, and I was astonished. I remember one of those times I was in Pagosa Springs and I think that was when Stephanie Burns and Linda were collaborating and learning that there were all these students, women, middle-aged women who were riding in fear that, and had been for years. And I was just dumbfounded. I thought, you have got to be kidding me. If I were doing something and I was always afraid, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. right. I couldn't get some way to not be afraid and be safe. I, so I was astonished. So that is, and then I'm, as the more I taught, the, as you were speaking, the more aware I became of the power of an authority, even an instructor who's trying to be kind and generous, but having to be a leader, which sometimes means a higher phase, right? At how accommodating students sometimes would be in that they would put aside their own inner voice. Um, and I didn't like that. Um, and so sometimes when I've asked students that, you know, you, does your, is your horse saying yes? Yeah, I'm saying yes. How about you? I said, that's fine. I said, no, that's, that's fine is not a yes or a no. And, mm -hmm. Okay, well, sure. I said, no. That's, <laughs> so I really wanted people to listen to themselves and for safety and also just for the harmony. I mean, why would you want to ride if you're not saying yes and if your horse isn't saying yes? And then my being responsible for people, I wanted them to trust me and I didn't want people to get hurt. And so it was, it was the harmony and the trust, but, and it was the safety. Yeah. Uh, it, and it's just, so, go ahead. Sorry. Well, just as a way to get, especially women to get them to be strong, to say yes or no and not right mess around with it, pussyfoot around about it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that it just brings up a level of awareness too, that, you know, you can be in a clinic and you get so wrapped up in what's going on and, you know, you don't want to look like a fool and you want to not be late and not be slowing people up. And, you know, you have all these yeah. other things going on in your mind, but that posing that simple list of questions causes students to look at their horse and go, are you giving me a yes? <laughs> you know, and then, and then to be thinking about themselves and am I, am I giving a yes as well? Mm -hmm. And then also, like you said, you know, putting that trust in you that, you know, you're, you're also going to be looking out and if you see something, you're going to say something. And I just, it, there's so much wrapped up in that. That is yeah. so well, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And Pat talks yeah. about that too, about, you know, is the horse giving you a green light? Or yes. a yellow light, especially with starting first rides, you know, or a difficult horse, you know. Yes. What's what's going on there? Um, right. Yeah. I love that. I've I've used that a lot in my own horsemanship, but also in teaching that traffic light analogy. Um, and actually, if people haven't heard it, what would you what would you say about it? How would you explain it? Which the green light the traffic light. Um, well, the green light means go you know you have the horse's permission and if the assumption is that you're feeling great about it good about it right. uh, go and that the yellow means eh, this may not be the best thing and you better step back and address the issues that you're noticing and right. then see if you have a green light uh, and if you have a red light don't do it right. <laughs> don't right. even go there yeah run the red light like people do these days right um, right yeah um, yellow doesn't mean speed up Exactly, exactly, right. which is yeah. what we'll see. Yeah. And I've seen that, you know, I've uh, mostly I've I've done some training horses directly and starting a few horses. And and I remember one really talented warm blood mare. Um, and I was working alone, and so I turned loose one of my horses in the arena um, and put out the big green ball because I knew Callie would chase it, and then the mare I was on first rise would follow. Mm -hmm. I need mm -hmm. some way to draw her forward. Right. Well, it drew her forward, but you know, drew, drew, drew. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I, we need to go back to some groundwork because I wasn't comfortable. Uh, you know, I didn't come off or nearly so, but how bad it could get bad. Sure. Um, so I went back to the groundwork and I solved it on the ground. And then the next time I rode her, it was fine. And so yeah. um, rather than pushing through that. Right. Uh, yeah. 
that's, that's really great. Um, and that's another thing like your yeses or, you know, wherever that came from Linda's yeses, um, that traffic light analogy really causes you to think differently and to be more aware. And, right. um, I just, yeah, I think that's so, that's so good. And, and it, and this just occurred to me, it fits with the focus on relationship that this isn't a motorcycle. Um, this is a horse, an animal, a loving, feeling, sentient creature uh, right. who has his or her own opinions about what's going on right now. Right. And um, we need to always check in with that. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And speaking of uh, loving creatures, who, who is this that's joining you? Oh, I've got him. <laughs> this is Groucho. Oh, he's so, so cute. He, He's got the mustache. So that's after Groucho Marx. That's <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's great. And for those of you listening, uh, Nita Joe's cat just jumped up on her lap, this beautiful black and white cat. And that's great. <laughs> cool. And now it's time for a short commercial break. I'd like to invite you to join in on a brand new Facebook group called A Learner's Journey. The idea of this group came about because of all of the emails and comments that I'd get in response to these podcasts. And people would share their thoughts and stories about their journeys. And I just was feeling like it's a shame that I'm the only one that's reading these. So I came up with the idea for this group. But the group is way more than just responding to the podcast. It's a safe and supportive place for horse lovers to connect and inspire each other. And there are folks from all over the world. It's a wonderful, positive, inspiring place to be. So I'd love for you to join in. All you need to do is search for A Learner's Journey on Facebook and you should see the group. I'll also put a link to it in the show notes. So I hope you'll join us. And now back to the conversation with me and Joe. So you and I were having a conversation a few weeks ago. Um, you were in the area again, and we kept trying to get together and it wasn't working out. And so we ended up talking on the phone and it was really fun. And uh, we were, we were just talking a little bit about how, you know, priorities can start to shift and, um, oh, just, just how you view horses in your life can mm. start to change as, you know, different chapters open up in your life. And, you know, and especially as you start to get older. Um, and for me, I've had some injuries. And um, would you mind sharing a little bit about like where you're at now with yeah. horses? And because I think it would be really helpful for people to, to hear a little well, bit. Well, and I'm still in that process and maybe always will be. Um, but yeah, I, well, for those who, some people know this, some don't, but I just sold, uh, I had two mares for a long time. I went from five horses eight years ago down to two for the past few years. And Ellie, this lovely Atwood Ranch quarter horse mare, I sold her to a former working student in Idaho. And they've already had a great time moving cattle and all that stuff. But it's the first time I've had only one horse in almost 30 years. Um, wow. And so that feels huge in a way. Um, and it's partly, you know, that it's everything from the practical, it's expensive to board two horses now that I no longer have my own place. Um, I have other interests. Um, and I'm just older and I don't have any longer any specific horsemanship goals. So, you know, I used to wake up in the morning and think, okay, today I'm gonna work on this with this horse. I'm gonna work on that with that horse with a lot of excitement and anticipation about all of this. And now it's sort of like, well, I'd love to go see my horse and say hi and it'd be fun to go on a trail ride. But I just don't have the same ambition. Right. So, right. and there are other things in my life that I would like to pursue. So I just am kind of struggling with, is it okay to let go of that? I, when I think of not having a horse at all, that's like, whoa, because, you know, I've had a horse, except for about 12 years when I was going to college and graduate school and getting married and having babies, I've mm -hmm. always had a horse. Um, right. So, but that does enter my mind and it's, it's, yeah, it's okay. 
And yet I kind of miss the um, former sort of immersion in it. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I think part of my identity. Think, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, as I talk to so many different people and, you know, we're all in different places in our lives. And, um, and I think it's so important to, I don't know, I guess just honor or try to find the, the lesson in whichever chapter you're in. Yeah. And so often people can think that, well, I'm supposed to feel this way, or I'm supposed to do this thing, or, you know, I should have this high ambition and well, maybe the ambition is different now. Yes. You know, and yeah. like you said, it's okay and it's wonderful. And um, and I guess when we were talking, I was just like, oh, this would be so good for people to hear that that that, that things change and and it's it's, it's okay and yeah, um, you don't have to. And you know, some people are going to have a herd of horses their whole life, right? You know, because that's they live with them or whatever, and that is their their thing, and that's great. So I'm definitely not saying, okay, if you, if, as you get older, you're no, going to get rid of horses. <laughs> not at all. In but, fact, I have often said, um, you know, as you get older, you become even more and more aware of mortality and all of that. And thought, oh, I want to live to a hundred and then I want to die by being on a mad gallop and falling off and breaking my neck and then boom, it's done. And I've been doing what I love, but now right. it's like, well, maybe that's not how I want to go out. Right. You know, maybe I'd like to do some other things. So it's, it's partly recognizing that there are fewer and fewer choices as you get older. Mm -hmm. um, and then frankly, you know, my body isn't as quite as good and, as it was. And I get right. sore a little bit. And, right. Um, you know, so it's, it's, I think it's wise and smart, even though in some ways I fight against it to recognize those limitations. Um, and yet I... I have no way to live a life and compare, okay, now I don't have a horse, what's that like? And now I do, what's that like? I can't do that experiment. So, right. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And I, you talked about having some horse injuries. I haven't had a horse injuries as an adult, but um, I broke my wrist several years ago, roller skating. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> right. That has affected my confidence. Um, yeah. just knowing that, oh, I didn't, don't have the same reflexes I had. And here I had all, oh, I used to roller skate really nicely. And then it's like, boom. Um, so I, I think that's just part of the normal process. It is, it absolutely is. And I, I, with my own injuries and the healing that has happened, it's been fascinating to me. And I've shared this, um, in another interview, but it's, it's been really interesting to me, the role of our brain mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. like right after my injury, um, and I've had a few, but, um, soon after how fearful I was of everything. Like I knew going out into the pasture with one of my horses was if I got bumped, you know, it was not yeah. going to be good. So, right. and, but then as I started to heal, my confidence healed along with my body. Exactly. And so it just, it was just this big clear message to listen to, like, I think we were, we're raised to kind of push fear back and, yeah. you know, yeah. and there is a time where it can take over and not be good. Exactly. Right? exactly. But for me, it was this thing that I had never listened to before. Cause I've always kind of pushed through things and, you know, but I really was like, okay, I'm going to listen to this and there's value there. And it's, um, you know, it's trying to share something with me. And then as, as I listened and as my body healed, it, it went away. Right. So right. I think it's just, they, it's, they do go together. Um, yeah. And, and you're right about fear. We don't want it to take over and monopolize us, but fear is our friend. Yeah. And, you know, one person, I mean, lots of things that horses do don't scare me at all, mm -hmm. but there are things. I mean, it's not like I've never been afraid as an right. adult. Um, and I would hate to think of never having that capacity to be afraid or to listen to it. Right. Um, yeah. So, and, but the, the letting go and the transition as we get older is, it's not just about fear. It's about 
what do I, what do I want to choose to embrace now? Or do I want to keep embracing the same thing? Um, right. And so that's, that's kind of like, I think with, for me, aside from school, um, getting into back into horses and then finding natural horsemanship and then pursuing that as far as I did, it was one of the few things in my life where I really have just been, I am determined. Yeah. I am dedicated. I'm persevering at this. And I, the stars aligned for me in a lot of ways. I was lucky, but I mm. really worked my butt off. Um, and I haven't done that with a lot of things um, in life. And so right. it's like, well, do I want to work that hard anymore? Or do I? So it's, it's all a jumble for me, Molly. I, yeah. I don't have any answers about right. it. Yeah. But I know I have to make room in my life. If I want to follow something else, some other passion, right think back to ninth grade, oh, you'd be a writer. It's like, well, if I ever wanted to write, I think I have to make the time and make right. the energy. And right. So it's that would be really cool. Wouldn't that be funny <laughs> to, you know, when you look back on your whole life story, that, that that moment in high school where they said, Well, you're either going to be a writer or you're going to work on a ranch, and you end right. up doing one of them and and then another. <laughs> That would be really funny. But you're, you know, you have so many other things like, you know, your family, you've got grandkids and, um, and then traveling. You, I love you know. to travel yeah. and I have become addicted to the game of pickleball. Oh, um, that's awesome. I love to ski. I still love to downhill ski and I don't know how yeah. long. So, and a lot of that is physical. I mean, you know, I, I just have always been that way. I think I've never right. grew being a tomboy. Um, so yeah, there, there are other things. Um, yeah, that's really cool. So, you know, we're talking about kind of looking back um, at the beginning um, and you're talking a lot about, you know, um, your, the journey for you to pursue this passion of natural horsemanship and become an instructor. And it is all encompassing. I mean, it is, it's, you jump in, you know, full yeah. body, full mind. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you did that for a long time and achieved, you know, high levels and touched so many people. I mean, you taught for quite a while. When you look back on that chapter, um, what's, what do you feel proud of with that? Um, well, that's another um, difficult question to answer. And <laughs> Being human and being me, the first thing that leaves my mind is all the mistakes I made. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I, I know also though that um, there were a lot. I think a lot of. I think I planted, helped plan as a part of a larger universe of of Pirelli and natural horsemanship instructors, planted seeds, and um, hopefully they've all most of them have sprouted and there are a lot that I don't know about. And some I do know about. And um, thanks to the students own perseverance and enormous dedication and hard work that they've done amazing things. Right. And I don't mean amazing in the sense of ribbons and trophies, but just in their own life um, with their horsemanship. And then I'm really, proud of the first horse I ever started, um, who was Sadie, who was on the calendar a couple times. And um, she was 18 months old when I discovered Pirelli. And I started her myself on the basis of the first clinic using her mother, her dam. And she went on and became a star. And that just really, um, you know, and that's, that's not about other students. It's about me and that horse and absolutely and I were able to create uh, right well yeah. and then what you learned from her and you sh you oh, know you shared yeah. with other people and yeah. uh and inspired I mean I I had never saw the two of you in person but I remember seeing videos of you playing with her on campus and um you know how many how many people were inspired by watching that you know so it's really cool um so one I have a couple more questions for you, but one of them is um, for folks that are in, you know, in the thick of it, they're, they're in their horsemanship journey. Um, 
and maybe, you know, they're, they're having the ups and downs that mm-hmm. we all have. Um, what, what's something that you could share with them to help keep them going? <laughs> uh, you have great questions. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and as you said, we all have these ups and downs. And sometimes we lose sight of that, that that's just human. And it's the nature of the learning process. You know, if, if, if there weren't mistakes to be had, again, as you said, we, we, there would be nothing to learn. Right. Um, and I like to use the analogy of looking back on our lives, no matter how old we are, um, that think of all the things we've learned and that we had to fall down literally to do it, learning to walk. Little kids fall down all the time when they're learning to walk. Yep. Nobody thinks, oh, you failed. I mean, I hope not. Um, right. Or learning to talk. You know, the, the, the <laughs> everything about that is, I think, just captures what, as adults, the learning process still is. But as adults, we've accomplished things and we've become competent and capable and we've got things that we've got, you know, I can do this. And so it's harder to go back and be like a little kid where you yeah. have to learn. So I think that just to recognize that, yeah, this is not easy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't, I think one of the, and this is maybe a different question slightly, but one of the biggest pitfalls that I've noticed with people learning this horsemanship is that it takes work. It takes practice. It takes discipline. It takes hours. I don't care how talented you are or how talented your horse is. You can't learn this just an hour twice a month. Um, right. You can't. Right. It takes hours and hours of practice and perseverance. And so we have to be disciplined and good students recognizing that of course I'm going to make mistakes and of course I'm not going to understand some things and of course my horse may suffer a little bit because of it Um, right so it's I don't know if that really helps people but just to keep in mind that everybody else you know the saying we've all heard the only job where you get to start at the top is post hole digging Mm -hmm. (laughs) nobody starts at the top right and so Yeah. yeah That's, that's really great. And I, I love um, what you shared about thinking back to our first lessons as kids, like, you know, walking and talking and, you know, you think about the kid that's learning to walk and they fall down and everybody goes, Oh, but it's, it's kind of like this, Oh, you know, almost like a little celebration, like, look, right. you fell, but it was your first walk. And then you get, get it back up. up. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's this big, um, you've got this cheering section right. as opposed to later on where somewhere along the line, we start building this idea that if you fall again and again, or fail or make mistakes yeah. again and again, that there's something wrong with you, or you're not ever going to get it. And, you know, to have that, picture in my mind of a little kid walking yeah. and you know they fall and they don't just go oh there's that not going to try that again <laughs> <laughs> not even going to get that but to I gotta crawl that. for the rest of my life <laughs> yeah exactly um that that's in us that that's born in us that will to keep going and to to remember that that we can kind of harness that and right. then to hear from you know, people like you that have gone and, and achieved a certain level and, and can say, Hey, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work, but man, you know, I, I can't think of any other thing that I would have rather have done. Right. Um, it's, it's it's enormously gratifying. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's really helpful. Um, okay. So I have one last question for you. Um, this one isn't, is not a hard one. I don't think. (laughs) So you mentioned that um, you're still teaching mm-hmm. um, and doing, you know, private lessons mostly. So yeah. um, how, how do people find you or are you kind of just doing like if, if somebody's nearby and well, um, people try to reach out to you? Um, I do get occasional um, emails based on the Prelly website because I'm still listed as an instructor and right. now as I'm in Colorado. So I've, some people have found me that way. And um, I have, did have a couple of students uh, where I board, um, you know, so that is another way. Um, 
So yeah, it's just, it's been kind of hit and miss like that. I haven't gone looking for it. Um, I just mostly wanted to keep my toes dipped in and help. I've helped a few students just through email and video and stuff like that. So I'm happy to be available to somebody who wants some coaching, who wants a lesson. And I'll go as far as I've been to Denver and I've been up in the mountains and, um, and then also uh, in other ways. So it's, it's fun and I'm happy to do that. So through the Prelly website or I'm on Facebook. and Facebook. Okay, yeah. great. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you. This was wonderful. Um, and it's your, it's, you've just finished your first podcast interview. Well, Congratulations. I, it is my first Molly. Thank you. <laughs> um, it, it was awesome. It was fun. It was lots of fun. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nita Joe. One of the things that came to my mind as I was listening to it again is how important it is maybe now more than ever to hear each other's stories. And sometimes they're stories that aren't maybe like ours, but in hearing each other's stories, it often causes us to think of our own and think about you know some of the good things and some of the challenges and hopefully we'll find some nuggets to help us on our journey and i hope that with with this conversation that you just heard and one of the things that really popped out for me is the idea that learning is going to involve mistakes we're going to fail we're going to fall on our faces and just like the little kid walking for the first time if we can learn to be our own cheering section uh, that would be awesome. So I want to leave you with a quote that I found and it's unknown. I don't know who it's from. Um, but I just thought it kind of is a wonderful message, um, to end this episode. Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes it's the quiet voice at the end of the day, whispering, I will try again tomorrow. So keep showing up, keep trying. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please make sure to subscribe or follow um, and share it with other folks. So I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.